I use the term evolution here, I use it in two senses. One, the, the evolution through time, but also the other term in which evolution is usually used, an evolution towards increasing complexity. We know, as has been mentioned earlier on today, that Ireland is well known as a very FDI-intensive economy. Uh, foreign multinationals employ about half the manufacturing labour force here, which is about twice the EU average and one and a half times the average for Central and Eastern Europe. Services everywhere are less FDI intensive, but the same proportions apply in services. The share of Irish services employment in foreign multinationals is around twice the EU average and one and a half times Central and Eastern European average. So hence, Ireland is a very FDI intensive economy and it's very frequently taken as a case study of the impact of multinationals on an economy. Almost all ways we tend to think of this as a consequence of Ireland's outward orientation. And clearly the multinationals that we have here now are for the most part very export oriented. Though there are a range of different kinds of multinationals, you know, and Marks and Spencers and so on are multinational as well, but not export oriented. But when we think of foreign multinationals in Ireland, we think of the, their export orientation. But Ireland has a much longer history of foreign direct investment than we frequently think about. So as I say, we think about it in terms of, you know, consequence of the opening up of the Irish economy in the 50s and 60s. But in fact, Ireland's first major achievement in an export-oriented, attracting an export-oriented multinational was Ford Motor Company. It began tractor production for export in Cork in 1919 and at, by 1929 employed almost 6,000 workers. Now, Irish people will understand 6,000 is a big number. If you're not Irish, that might seem like a small number, but remember we're in a small economy here. So a firm that employs a thousand workers, particularly at you know any time back in history, these were big substantial firms. Ford Motor Company, under protectionism, which you know came in, actually it came in 1924-25, but kind of reached a, a, its peak then in the 1930s. And um, so the Ford Company started then to assemble cars for distribution in Ireland, and by the 1950s was still employing a thousand. But there was substantial tariff jump in foreign direct investment in the protectionist era. I hope that photograph comes up because I put it there because it's just a fantastically dramatic photograph. It shows John Lamas as Minister for Industry and Commerce opening a factory in 1937. So uh, this is frequently something that's kind of not focused on in the history books, but some of these foreign multinationals also were very substantial. So by around 1960, the, the multinationals here, which were all tariff jumpers, you know, employed, each of them employed over a thousand workers, Cadbury's, Dunlop, Clark Shoes, the British cigarette manufacturers, and so So FDI has a longer history than we typically think of. An interesting question to ask is what was the sectoral distribution of FDI in the protectionist era? You can see a quote here from Industry and Commerce in 1928 that says there seems to be no general principle of course, things have moved on since then. Thankfully, we now have a much greater clue about what kind of sectors attract FDI. So historian Mary Daly uh, focuses there on the importance of advertising. Now, of course, again, we think of you know the knowledge capital model of foreign direct investment, um, which where multinationals tend to congregate in sectors that are advertising intensive and R&D intensive. And just some recent work that I've been doing show, shows that exactly these sectors explain the pattern of foreign multinationals in Ireland under protectionism, as is the case today. So just as is, as is the case today, we don't have many foreign multinationals in sectors like wood and furniture, iron and steel manufacturers. Whereas we, you know, multinationals dominate in sectors like chemicals, electrical equipment, wireless TV and telecommunications. And that was exactly so in the protectionist era as well. You know, so particular sectors are conducive to multinational investment. And I think it's quite interesting that that same pattern exists uh, over these different eras. In the mid-1950s, even before we liberalised trade, we stumbled on the strategy of attracting in export-oriented industry through what's called export profits tax relief. The photograph on the right, Irish people will know, it's a famous postcard, you might also have seen it last week, because the red-haired boy in the photograph died last week. 
The photograph on the left is Puerto Rico, the US protectorate in the Caribbean, and that's where Irish policymakers got the idea for using export profits tax relief to bring in export oriented industry. This is another photograph that I think is beautiful. Faber Castell, one of the first German multinationals that came into Ireland in the mid 1950s, set up in Fermoy in County Cork. So, in the mid 1950s, we introduced this new policy of export profits tax relief to incentivize foreign multinationals to come into Ireland and use it as an export platform. A very smart move because it didn't threaten existing interest groups in Ireland, mm -hmm. so, and it obviously facilitates the <coughs> labour movement uh, towards free trade. So then we started to get new waves of multinationals coming into Ireland um, at that time. The pattern, the sectoral pattern, has obviously changed over time in line with comparative advantage and other factors. So you can see in 1973, I only realized this morning, whoops, this is not CSO data, because CSO data doesn't go back that far in terms of distinguishing between foreign and indigenous industries. So these are fur false data that I use. So you see, textile, clothing, and footwear were important, an important sector for multinationals back in 73, now insignificant. The multinationals now have already congregated in the high-tech sectors, particularly pharmaceuticals, electronic and electrical devices, medical devices. Uh, and so on. So this is the shifting pattern of multinational investments into Ireland. This is in terms of manufacturing though. The other fact that we've seen is over time is the increasing importance of multinational investment in internationally <coughs> traded services sectors. Back in 1991, employment, foreign sector employment in traded services was around what 10% or less of what it was in manufacturing. Now the numbers are much closer, it's about 60, 40. So there's been a huge increase in the nature of FDI coming into Ireland, a movement out of, uh, out of manufacturing and into services. Frequently, as Chris Van Eger and I found in the paper we published a couple of years ago, it's in the same company. So the, 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 the computer makers, they don't make computers in Ireland anymore, but they're all still here. They, they just do other things, they, they themselves have moved for manufacturing in, in, into services. But clearly there's a lot more going on than, than, than that, that just intra-firm transition. This point came up earlier in the questions directed towards uh, Tim Sturgeon, that a lot of the increase in complexity that we see about multinational behavior in the last couple of decades has to do with corporation tax and asymmetries between different corporation tax jurisdictions. You'll notice that the only data that I've used here in this presentation are all employment data. Most Irish economists who work on the issue of you know, foreign multinationals in Ireland, you know, we use employment data rather than output data because we basically, by and large, don't trust the output data. It tends to be corrupted, you might say, by, at least we've, we've always assumed it has been, and um, by the extent of transfer pricing. Now, transfer pricing is a legal practice that multinationals engage in, whereby they price trades between subsidiaries in different locations. But if um, multinationals have a choice between different transfer pricing processes, and they will choose the one that allows them to you know, maximize their profits. Um, Transfer pricing, of course, is a much bigger problem, much, much more difficult to police when intellectual property is important. Because if you think of a pharmaceutical factory in Ireland, you have bulk, cheap bulk chemicals coming in one end, out at the other end comes the Prozacs and the Viagras and so on. So something cheap going in one end, something very expensive coming out the other. That looks like those workers are spectacularly productive, but we know that's not what's going on. In fact, I looked at the cola concentrates sector a number of years back, where Pepsi and Coke did, did a lot of their concentrate production. Exactly the same thing, cheap citrus fruits going in one end, very valuable cola concentrates coming out the other. Productivity in the cola concentrate sectors was about a million probably pounds, as it was then, uh, per, per worker. Very, very productive, but we know it's not because the workers are spectacularly productive, though we might sometimes like to say so. Um, another interesting
brief, it's an issue again that Tim touched on, uh, though he didn't mention the parties. Is the two major parties in America have very different philosophies of corporation tax. The Democrats, uh, well, the, the different philosophies are called capital export neutrality versus capital import neutrality. But it means the American tax system is very complex, and it's something that I spent you know, much of the last year or so trying to figure out. So issues. But I first started hearing about these issues from IDA people in Ireland, so people are aware of the importance for Ireland. Things like issues like subpart F and uh, check the box and so on. These are very important because changes in the US corporation tax legislation influence the international architecture of US multinationals. I'm on my second last slide. Um, and so, again, as I say, the, some of the questions directed towards Tim there, that we kind of, on top of the global production sharing that we've always been, that we've all been talk, talking about, there is also this complex playing by the multinationals of asymmetries in different corporation tax jurisdictions, and that really influences their financial architecture. And so the multinationals that we have in Ireland, they're primarily US multinationals. An awful lot of them come in through the Netherlands for particular tax-related reasons. They're in Ireland, but a lot of them are resident for tax purposes in the Cayman Islands and in the Caribbean, Caribbean tax haven, and yet they're American. So it's a bit like when Louis picked up a mobile phone and showed us the, the bits and pieces that come from all over the world. The multinationals that we have here have foot have their feet, foot, so it's they have feet in all these different locations around the world for tax purposes. And it, um, it makes it extremely complicated to try and figure out what exactly is happening. And the point is, if, the, if it's two and a half thousand multinationals that dominate world trade, well, these are the big multinationals that are playing this tax, uh, the tax game as well. So it's very, very, it's going to be very difficult to get a handle on what exactly is going, going on there. Of course we know that partly they can choose whether to make payments in the form of royalties and license fees to other members of the same group, other subsidiaries elsewhere, or they can choose to take some of this as profits. And, you know, and economists have figured out that you, know, you, you have strong evidence that this takes place. So it is, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to, 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 to populate um, that sort of grid in terms of figuring out what exactly is going on. Um, and conclusions for international trade people then, which is what I started as, um, export data of course now means something very different from what they meant 20 or 30 years ago. And the measures of revealed comparative advantage that most of us grew up on in university are really not so meaningful anymore. So. That's my 15 minutes of diatribe. <laughs> <laughs>